Hey guys, it's Daniel. For much of his life, Kurt Cobain felt at odds with his hometown, Aberdeen. The following is a quote from Kurt Cobain from September of 1992, where he discusses Aberdeen in a sarcastic manner. I say sarcastic because much of what he says is made up and exaggerated, but there are hints of truth amongst what he says. In this quote, he also talks about Eddie Vedder. Here's the quote. Quote, Aberdeen. It's a coastal town about 100 miles away from Seattle. It's a really small place, a very small community. Basically, if you're not prepared to join the logging industry, you're going to be beaten up or run out of town. I was run out of town. They chased me up to the castle of Aberdeen with torches, just like the Frankenstein monster. And I got away in a hot air balloon and came here to Seattle. Every time I've gone to Aberdeen lately, I felt a real big threat. Actually, Chris was beaten up at a Denny's one night. Some locals were giving him the eye. They started beating him up in the men's room saying, some local hero you are. Next thing he remembers, he was dancing on a table. Underneath the bridge of Aberdeen going over the south side of the town, I used to hang out with the homeless people and share Thunderbird wine with them. There's a little tent bum community there. They live in tents and just drink wine and roast marshmallows. I used to be a janitor at Lemon's Janitorial Service in Aberdeen. From a janitorial perspective, grunge is a fine mixture of cleaning solvents, not to be used in the toilet. It doesn't go well with porcelain. When I was a janitor, I used to work with these guys, Rocky and Bullwinkle. They'd clean the toilet bowls with their bare hands and then eat their lunch without washing their hands. They were very grungy. From a musical perspective, grunge is a fine mixture of hygiene paraphernalia. Bleach, Lysol, bubblegum flavored toothpaste, isopropyl, rubbing alcohol 90%, hand and body lotion, and conditioning shampoo. In terms of grunge, I'm bowing down gracefully and taking off my crown and giving it over to Eddie Vedder of Pearl Jam. He's now the representative of the youth of America because he stole my look and he uses it better than I. End quote. It's well documented that Kurt didn't like Eddie Vedder, at least not initially. During the 1992 MTV VMAs, Eddie Vedder and Kurt danced backstage, and during their dance, Kurt complimented Eddie. The following is a quote from Kurt Cobain where he discusses what he said to Eddie Vedder during their dance. Quote, I stared into his eyes and told him that I thought he was a respectable human, and I did tell him straight out that I still think his band sucks. I said, after watching you perform, I realized that you are a person that does have some passion. It's not a full contrived thing. There are plenty of other more evil people out in the world than him, and he doesn't deserve to be scapegoated like that. End quote. Regardless of this, however, that didn't stop Nirvana from pranking Eddie Vedder. This prank happened on Eddie Vedder during the making of the In Utero record in February of 1993. The following is a clip from one of my interviews with Steve Albini, the producer of In Utero, where he discusses what happened. I heard something very, I thought it was quite funny, about you during the sessions. Um, apparently you did a prank call to Eddie Vedder. And pretended you were a David Bowie's producer? Yeah, there were, a num there were a number of opportunities for prank calls during that session. The the Eddie Vedder one, there was a kind of a good-natured rivalry between Nirvana and Pearl Jam. Like, Pearl Jam were sort of the corporate face of the era. You know, the, the band was kind of assembled from constituent parts and was shopped as a product and then... It was very much an industry creation, as it were, whereas Nirvana were a, a grubby band that played in all the punk bars and worked their way up, sort of incrementally worked their way up to a, a position of status and where their audience just grew organically because they kept playing in front of more and more people and more and more people were responding to them. And so there was a, a contrast there between the sort of working musician underground, which I felt like I was a part of and which Nirvana were a part of and where we had a, a, a common peer group. And then this sort of industry creation, uh, which was at odds with, with their ethics and their aesthetic. Hmm. So there was a bit of a rivalry between Pearl Jam and Nirvana in that regard. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just a, sp a sort of a spontaneous spoof uh, called Eddie Vedder, and uh, I I said that I was Tony Visconti. Tony Visconti. Yeah, so I called. We called Eddie Vedder, and I said that you know I was Tony Visconti, and I wanted to get him in a studio with some real musicians, guys who could really play. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I don't remember much else about the conversation, but uh, the gist of it was that I was trying to, to tempt him to do a solo record um, and assemble a superstar backing band for him. And did he fall for it? I don't know. I mean, he <laughs> indulged me, but I, I, I couldn't tell if he was indulging me because he thought I was really Tony Visconti or because he, he, he didn't want to take the bait on something that might have been a prank call. <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this interview I did with Steve Albini, make sure to subscribe for more because there is a lot more to come. All the interviews on this channel are original. I'm the one conducting all of them and editing all the videos together. So if you do want to support me, in all sincerity, the best way to do so is simply to subscribe. Thanks for watching.